My name is Bryce Edelstein Lowback. I'm going to talk about um, boost ACO and boost serialization. And I'm also going to be talking about the uh, code base that I work, out, work on for Louisiana State University. So you can come on in. Uh, you might be able to sneak in there. So um, my colleagues and I, we work on this framework called HPX, um, which is a general purpose runtime system for applications of any scale. So that's, that's a term that needs some bit of explanation. So a runtime system is basically um, a program or, or software framework that's going to manage some part of the execution environment of another program or framework. So our, our um, runtime system is specifically for parallel and distributed applications. And we uh, promote the uh, asynchronous methodologies for pr parallel programming, specifically using futures and data flows as opposed to bulk synchronous frameworks such as MPI. So our, our frameworks for both shared memory and dis distributed memory systems. So for like big SMP machines and also big clusters of machines. All right, so my ta this talk, I basically, a couple months ago, I, I was looking over our code and talking, thinking about what I was going to talk about at BoostCon this year. And I thought, well, it would be cool to kind of present some of the work that we've done and some of the things that we've learned and experienced while working with these two libraries, which can be a little bit finicky. And in, in particular, we use these two libraries together, which is a use case which can be very powerful, but I don't think it's gotten a lot of coverage. And I think it's especially boost serialization has not gotten a lot of coverage at previous C++ Now conferences. So the, this talk, I'm going to basically talk a little bit about ACO, then a little bit about serialization. Then I'm going to talk a lot about working together with those two libraries. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the library that I work on. And then I'm going to end it, if I have time, with some, so there's like five or ten um, lesser known like tips and tricks for ACO and serialization. Okay, so all the code for that I'm going to show here is going to be at that GitHub repository. And the code that's actually in these slides is going to be a little bit of a cut down version just so that they'll fit. In particular, a lot of the error handling will be just not there. Um, so don't copy anything directly from these slides. Um, and basically assume those statements for all the code examples just to, again, get everything to fit onto the slides. All right, so we're going to start off with ACO. So can I get a show of hands, people who have used Boost ACO? All right, so it's a lot of you. Um, OK, so we might skim through this a little bit. Uh, raise your hands if you feel that you're an absolute expert with Boost ACO. <laughs> OK. How about, how about comfortable with it, fairly comfortable? OK. So uh, ACO is this library for asynchronous and synchronous I.O. A lot of people tend to think of it just as this networking library. It's actually useful for a lot more than just networking. Um, the default, the most commonly used things, things that we'll see is the network socket programming. Um, ACO is based on a proactor design, which we're going to get to a little more in the next slide. Um, but some of the other things you can do with ACO are things like serial ports and also things like remote direct memory access, even, sh even into process communication. And one thing that um, I think I'm going to probably over the next year be doing is using ACO to manage um, GP, GPU computations, um, things like OpenCL to wrap them into some ACO functionality so that I can do asynchronous computations on my GPUs. All right, so this is um, the diagram of, of, of a proactor-based design. So um, this is a little, a lot of fancy words and whatnot, but basically you, we've got some asynchronous operation that we want to perform, and we have some person who's going to perform it, the initiator. So they're going to go in and they're going to say, hey, I want to perform this operation, and they're going to pass it off to some asynchronous operations processor. And it's going to get put into, um, it's going to be executed and, and uh, asynchronously, and eventually we're going to end up with, with some completion event, which it represents when the asynchronous operation has finished. 
And then that completion event is going to be dequeued from this completion queue by a proactor. So a proactor is what an ACO we would call IO service. Um, and when you call IO service run or IO service um, poll, that's when you're basically calling this demultiplexer, which is pulling out um, a completion events to execute. So this is um, an ACO echo server uh, in C++11. And uh, I'm using a recursive lambda here as my completion handler. So let's go through this, just for anybody who might not have experience with ACO. So at the top here, I've got the declaration of this IO service. Now, IO service is, again, going to be this thing that I'm going to use to actually execute my completion handlers. Now, normally, if we're doing actual asynchronous, if, we're, if we want to do really something, do something asynchronously, then we're going to have it in another thread. We're going to have some thread that's going to be invoking IO service run. But in this example, we're not going to do that. So then we're going to create this acceptor, this TCP acceptor, which is going to accept new connections. And we're use, we specify our endpoint here. We're going to run it on port 2000. Then inside of this for loop, we're going to set up a socket. And we're going to accept a connection on the socket. And so now we're going to set up some buffer, which we're going to read into. All right, so this is the slightly convoluted part. So I've got this std function, which has the call signature of an ACO completion handler. So that's going to be something that's going to be called when my asynchronous option operation is completed. So this function, I'm going to stick a lambda into it. So let's just focus on the outer lambda first. So I've got a lambda, and it's going to call asynchronous write after I get in a read, because this is an echo server. Basically, as soon as I get a read, I just want to write it back to the client. So I'm going to call the write asynchronous write, and I'm going to pass another lambda to asynchronous write. And that lambda is going to go back and basically do the same thing, the same read that I'm about to do right here. So it's going to basically recursively call this, this function, which is representing my lambda. Now, you have to do this with an std function because it will not work if you just try to do recursive lambdas otherwise. And so that's, then there's the, the inner, inner lambda. Oops, I don't know, highlight the end of the code there, so let me take a step back. So then at the bottom here, I'm going to kick off my asynchronous operations with socket.asyncreadsum. And I'm going to pass that, that, func that std function f. And then this is going to loop, then I'm going to call IO service run, and this is going to loop until the client disconnects, basically. Um, and it'll, it'll, every time it, that the client sends me a message, I'm going to read it and then send it back to the client. Okay, so ACO, one thing we showed in this example is ACO, these buffers. So buffers are basically a tuple of an address and a size um, or a length in ACO. And so these are, these are how we, we pass in input and output to ACO, which is going to obviously use scatter gather operations um, going through the kernel. So that's scatter read is, means that I'm receive, receiving something into multiple input buffers and the scatter write or a gather write is when I'm taking multiple buffers, multiple contiguous regions of memory, and I'm going to write them out um, to some endpoint. So there's two basic buffer types. Um, there's const buffer, which is what you'd use for writes, and then there's a mutable buffer, which is what you're going to use for reads, or which is what you're going to use for reads and writes. Um, and it's also convertible to a const buffer. All right, so ACO streams. Th these are the set of concepts that um, are, are model the asynchronous event processors. So the things that are actually going to execute the uh, IO operation and then wait on it and then get back to us later. So these streams, they're all stream oriented. So the data is a continuous byte sequence. There's no message boundaries. And we're gonna ha we might have reads and writes that are going to transfer less data than we requested. So short reads and short writes. So there are four models of these. Um, and they all get these numbers read sum, async read sum, write sum, and async write sum. Generally, any class in ACO that fulfills one of these models is going to fulfill the other four. So for example, basic stream socket, um, which is what the TCP socket is, is a type def for, and the basic serial port, 
both fulfill all these concepts. All right, so now I'm going to talk about two uh, ACO backends that um, we've written in the context of our, our uh, work um, code framework. So the first one is an interprocess backend which uses boost interprocess um, message queue in, to communicate between two processes on a single machine. And it, it's a good bit faster than if you're just using, say, Unix sockets. So we've got, we've got an acceptor which is similar to um, the operation of the TCP acceptor. And we, we kind of mocked it up so that it would be able to interoperate in the same code where we had been using um, ACO for TCP um, related networking. So this fulfills the socket acceptor service model. And the endpoint is just a string, um, which is the message queue, the name of the message queue. And then we've got um, a data window, which basically represents our socket, which would be the equivalent of a TCP socket. All right, so the next little backend I'm going to talk about is for this network protocol called InfiniBand. Has anybody heard of InfiniBand? All right, decent showing. Um, so InfiniBand is a low latency network protocol. Um, it's a bunch of not too interesting facts. It's used a lot on supercomputers. Um, it's, it's got the dominant network market share on the top 500 list. And so there's, there's briefly, it's, it's a good bit lower latencies and faster than Ethernet. Um, so which is why we largely use it because in HPC we're really we're caring not only about bandwidth but about the low latency. Yeah, sorry. It's a, it's a, uh, low yeah, it's a low level transport, Physical, like but InfiniBand will also generally refer to the the protocols that are that are at the higher levels of the stacks. So there's a number of different protocols, okay. but but yeah, it, it it's a physical transport. Sorry, should have clarified on that. Yes, it it is not going over Ethernet or anything. It's it's at the physical inter interconnect okay, level. For a or a city or right. Okay. Right. right. Okay. So the InfiniBand backend for ACO also works very similar to our I IPC one. I forgot to repeat. Sorry about that. I forgot, forgot to repeat the question. Uh, so the InfiniBand backend works very similar to our, our IPC one. So um, it uses, the, this is the, the protocol equivalent, which is um, the UVerbs RDMA. And the nice thing about this is that with some rather trivial changes, this ACO backend could be made to work for any remote direct memory access protocol. So things like um, Miranet, or I can't really think of any other good examples um, on a Cray system, for example, or a big IBM system, a lot of these interconnects use similar technologies. And so we've got, we've again have an acceptor. This one's a little bit more convoluted because we have to bootstrap the connection over TCP IP, um, mostly because it was easier for us to do it that way. And then we've got two different representations of what is the equivalent of our TCP socket, um, a client context and a server context, one for the initiator side and one for the, um, the other side. And so these, again, fulfill all the same, con the, those four main models, which means that we can basically drop this in in the same place where we'd been using TCP previously. So the, the next thing um, I want to talk about is, is the, some future work that I'm hoping to do, which is using ACO for GPGPU computations. So I got this idea when we, we originally developed this InfiniBand backend to communicate with a certain coprocessor which used this interconnect fabric. And so I, I started thinking, well, why don't we just you know, abstract away OpenCL calls through ACO? And that would be very nice because it would give us um, a, a rather generic way of doing asynchronous um, computation on our GPUs. All right, so boost serialization. So how many people have used boost serialization? How many people have used boost serialization for like sending things over the wire, like over the network? Okay, got one or two. Protobuf. Yeah, Protobuf is one of the alternatives we'll talk about in a couple slides. So boost serialization is a library for transforming C++ objects into some representation, a sequence of bytes, and then later deserial or converting those sequence of bytes back into an object. All right, so the major, the major feature of serialization that um, makes it attractive for my group is the ability to serialize 
derived classes through base class pointers. We, we haven't found any other serialization framework that can actually do that and do that in a way that's not, that's, that's safe and is not gonna have any slicing of, of the objects. So that's the main reason why, why we're using it instead of something like S, um, S11N or protobuf. Some of the other features, it has support for in individual data structure versioning, um, object tracking, built-in support for the STL libraries, support for serializing things like std shared pointer and boost shared pointer. Um, and it's got intrusive and non-intrusive interfaces, which can be important for legacy code. So one of the serialization works with these arch archive objects. So we've got two different models for archives. So the first model is the saving archive model. So we have these expressions where we've got some object X and we have an archive. And this operation should, should basically add the sequence of bytes that's representing this to that archive. So it's going to serialize it and then add the bytes to this archive. And loading archive is very similar, just the opposite direction, that we're going to read something from an archive. So there are some other type requirements here, but they're really not important. I'm going to skim over a lot of the nitty gritty details of serialization because they're a little bit scary. So the serializable model is, is the concept that classes have to fulfill to be able to be used with serialization. So all of the primitives, primitive types, the STL containers, the serialization provides support for all of these for serializing them. So a type T is serializable if we, it's got a member function that has this form. So it's a template function. It's taking um, an archive. And then the second argument is going to be the version of the archive. Or if you have a global function, this is the non-intrusive version. And I'm sorry, that version is not going to be of the archive. That's going to be the version of the data structure itself. All right, so we've got some class here called coordinate. It's just an X and a Y. And you can see the serialization implementation is very simple. So what we're saying is we're saying just R and then the AND operator X and then R and the AND operator and Y. All right, so this is the most basic example of how to use the boost serialization library. So we've got some string stream. Serialization, all the archives are stream based. So they can take as an argument for what they're going to actually write the data to, some, some string it has to inherit from std um, I, I stream or std o stream. So here we've got a text O archive, which is going to be an output archive. And we've got to create our coordinate here, and then we just stick it into this archive. Then we're going to print out the representation in between these two blocks, and now we're going to read it back in. So we've got an input archive. And again, very similar code, just sort of reversed in direction. Now, the reason that we're putting these scopes here is because these archives will write out when they go out of scope, basically. So we don't want to have the, the text O archive in scope when we have the text I archive um, reading from it. All right, so this is what the output of that program will give us. This is using the um, serialization text archives. So the first. The first part there is the archive signature. This is so that you can write it to files, and it's not mistaken for some other type of file or, or binary data. And then we've got the archive version. And we've got the class ID and the class version. And we've got the actual representation of the object. So as, as you can see from this, one of the downsides of serialization, and this is the same in the binary archives, is that serialization is not always the most ideal thing if you were sending data over the net, because it's not as, the, as compact of a format. It's really designed for persistence of objects that might need to be laid, loaded later with different versions um, over a period of many years. All right, so serialization of derived classes through base class pointers. So this is, as I said, this is the main reason why my group's using serialization. So it requires explicit registration of the derived class with serialization's class registry. Can anybody tell me why? All right, so it's a, it's a somewhat convoluted and technical answer. But so the serialization code for the derived class may never be instantiated because of the way that virtual functions work and the way that virtual base classes are going to work. So you might not ever instantiate the code. 
um, which is a problem for serialization because then it can never get the code. It can never find the code in your shared object. And also, so we need some identifier to uniquely identify the derived class in serialization's class registry. So when you think about the problem of you've got a base class pointer and you want to write it out and you want to call basically a template function, well, you can't have a virtual template function. So on the, on the writing side, there's, there's some challenge there. You have to find a way to determine what the derived class is and then cast the base pointer to the derived cl class. And then when you're reading it back in, you've got to figure out from the archive what the derived class is and again do the same thing. So the way that serialization does this is basically they've got these big static um, uh, registries where they register type information that's fairly portable for the derived classes and the base classes. And they use these registries to determine what, what derived class to cast these um, pointers to. All right, so here's an example of, of um, what the code would look like for a derived class that we want to serialize. So it's, it's pretty much sim similar to what we have for you know, the regular um, classes. But you do have to have this base object um, call right here. And this does two things. First of all, this is going to call whatever serialization code you might have in your base class. And it's also going to do some registration magic to allow serialization to actually operate. And at the bottom here, this is the registration call, which is going to make serializations registries aware of the fact that this is a derived class that it needs to map. And what will happen is in the actual archive, you'll, it'll use that string B to identify the derived class. All right, so yeah, that, that line's important. That line's important. you could definitely accidentally have name conflicts. So the question was, can you have name conflicts? And you can. Um, so there's a version of this macro which just uses whatever the name of the class is. I, don't, I never like to use that version because, generally speaking, I like to, to manually myself put the string in there so that I'm thinking about it a little bit. So this would not be good practice. You wouldn't want to have a one letter um, name here with some mang name mangling schemes that might have all sorts of fun. So the two main alternatives that I think are competitive with serialization are pro first protobuf, um, which is uh, I'll say is noticeably faster than serialization. I've done some benchmarks, um, but it does not have the same set of functionality. So first of all, you have to have this custom this dot proto file, and you have to compile that with your project using this proto c proto bu protocol buffer compiler. It doesn't have really any non-intrusive support at least from my understanding, that it's going to generate the data structures that you're going to send over the wire in the, from this .proto file. And it, it doesn't really have built-in interoperation with STL or boost data structures. The other one is S11n, um, um, which has a little bit more in terms of feature completeness. So it, it supports multiple data formats. Um, it does have the, the non-intrusive support for serialization. And it has built-in support for STL. But neither of these support um, serializing the derived class through the base class pointer. And I think it's pretty safe to say that there's no other library out there um, that does that. Um, having been familiar with the serialization code, I can tell you that it's a pretty hard problem to solve. Uh, I don't know if anybody else knows of any. All right. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about object transmission. So by object transmission, I mean using serialization to serialize something, sending it over the wire with ACO, and then reconstructing it on the other end. So this is something that's useful if you're doing remote procedure calls, remote method invocation, if you're doing active messaging, which we're going to talk about a little later. Um, and it, it's also nice because it can simplify your network communication. So you just go once and you write your serialize function. And then any place where you're doing your communication, you don't have to worry about how am I reading it? How am I writing it? You just kind of say, hey, you know, re read through this, this set of data re or write, write this set of data. So again, we've got our coordinate, which we saw before. So this is the most minimal example for writing an object to the wire with um, boost ACO. So we've got some, I, this IO stream object here is basically a, a, a standard library IO stream that uses ACO for, commu for synchronous communication. And 
I'm opening up this connection to localhost and port 2000. Oops. And then I've got some binary archive, and I'm just going to send it on over. So that, that was the client code. This is the server side code, and it's a little bit longer because I've got to have the acceptor in here to accept the incoming connection. And so here I'm going to, yeah, go ahead. So the, the question is, why did I have the uh, string for the port number on one side? The answer is that ACO's resolver um, will want you to give it the port is, as a string because it might, you might want to give it like a name of a service. For example, if you wanted to connect to a daytime server, which is on port 13, you could just say daytime. And unfortunately, ACO doesn't give you any overloads for the resolver that will take um, the port number. So generally speaking, if you're writing ACO code with TCP, you'll end up casting something from int to string at least two or three times in your code. Um, we'll, we'll see an example where I do that a few times a little bit later. All right, so again, here we've got some acceptor stuff. It's still pretty simple code. And so this is the most minimal example of how we can send an object over the wire using these two libraries. Right, so, well, yes, yeah, so that's localhost. Okay. That's saying localhost and use the v4 protocol. Okay. Okay. All right, so um, next we're going to talk about active messaging, which will directly lead us into um, talking about the sort of framework that I work on. So active messaging is, an active message is an object that is going to perform computation on its own. So normally when you're, send, when you're sending data, it's just data. When, you, when it gets to the receiving end, there's going to be some code there that's going to process it. With active messages, there's some reference to code or there's actually code contained itself in the message. So that when it gets to the receiving end, it's going to be executed and there won't be any real logic on the receiving end that's going to know what to do with the data other than to turn it back into, a, into this invocable object. So we're going to build a simple active messaging runtime system. It's about 500 lines of code, um, which is going to send a functor that will print hello world on some other machine. Um, and it's, it's a fairly slimmed down version, um, and, or it's a slimmed down analog of what my work code base does. Um, and hopefully it will be able to express why this sort of um, technology is useful. So we're going to have two threads. We're going to have an IO thread, which is going to run the IO services event processing loop. And it's, we're going to be very strict about that. We're not going to let anything happen on the thread that's running the IO services dot run method that's not either you know, getting the completion handler and immediately handing off the work to our second thread, which is going to be our execution thread. So any amount of computation, we're going to try to move it away from the IO thread. The reason to do this is that as quickly as possible, we want to we want to finish com executing the completion handler and get back into the I/O loop so that we can process messages as quickly as possible. Now, in this particular example, it's maybe not the most important thing in the world because we're using two threads. But this example is something that could be easily extended to a system where you've got multiple nodes and multiple different threads, both receiving messages and multiple threads that are executing the messages as they get received. So we're going to use TCP IP for communication. Um, and we'll use ACO, obviously. And again, this is where the code is. It's in a directory called active messaging. So let's go over the division of, of the work between these two threads. So the IO thread is going to wait for our IO events, events to complete. Then it's going to invoke our completion handlers. And the other responsibility that it has is that it's responsible for joining the execution thread. After the execution thread, indicates that it's time for the system to shut down. It was doing this a little earlier. Let's see if it's going to go back to flip-flop or not. Okay. So the execution thread is going to be responsible for doing maintenance computations. Specifically, it's going to be responsible for serializing and deserializing messages. It's going to be responsible for executing our, our user messages. And it's going to be responsible for breaking the IO threads event loop and initiating the shutdown of the system. 
All right, so we're going to have three basic data structures here that we're going to use. First of all, we're going to have an action-based class. This is going to be what all of our active messages will inherit from. We're going to have our runtime object, which is going to manage the I.O. and execution thread. It's going to manage all of our connections, and it's going to provide various different APIs that we're going to need to actually do stuff, specifically an API for connecting to other machines, an API for writing messages, and an API for starting and stopping the runtime system, and for scheduling local tasks on the execution thread. So then we're going to have a third um, class called connection, and that's going to represent a single TCP socket to another endpoint for both reading and writing. All right, so this is our action class. So we've got, you know, virtual detour, pretty standard. We've got a call operator, which is going to take one parameter um, with reference to our runtime class. We've got this clone function, which we're going to need for um, create for serialization and deserialization a little bit later. You could probably refactor the, the code to work around that, though. And then we have a default serialization implementation. Now, again, we can't make template functions virtual, but what will happen is that base object utility that we talked about earlier is eventually going to have to call that. So you can't just leave out the serialization function for your base class, even if you have nothing to serialize. All right. So we're going to start off with the, uh, the read interface for reading stuff. And then we're going to we'll slowly build up to, to a kind of design overview of what this little runtime system will look like. So this is what our connection looks like, or part of it at least. So we've got a reference to our runtime, a socket. We have a buffer for reading the size of each message. And we have a buffer that's going to contain the actual data for the message. So we've got three main functions here that are going to be doing our reading. First, we have async read, which is going to initiate a new asynchronous read. Then we have a handler, which is going to handle reading in the size of the message. And then finally, we have another handler, which is going to be invoked by the first handler asynchronously, which is going to read in the actual data. All right, so this is what the control flow looks like. So we have some initial call from somewhere that starts off this loop. And then async read is going to asynchronously call handle read size. And then handle read size will asynchronously perform a write, which will then call handle read data. And then handle read data is going to start up another asynchronous read. All right, so this is what async read looks like. So the first thing we do in async read is we're going to clear our buffers. And every time we, we're going to do a new here because every time we do the read, the, um, the read data, we're going to pass off the buffer to be deserialized. And we want to, as quickly as possible, get back into a place where we can read. So what we do is just we allocate a new buffer each time that we do a read. And we let the, uh, we let the old buffer be used for deserialization and then go out of scope. So then we have our async read. First argument, here's the socket. We have our buffer right here, which is for reading in the size. We have to know this because we've got to know how large the message is, because these are all stream-based um, constructs. So there's no real boundary between the messages. We have to know how long it is. And so then we, we're going to bind this, um, the handle read, which is going hand, to handle the read of the size, and then call handle read data. Sorry, was there? Um, so the buffer, which buffer? The buffer for the size? OK, so the one that I knew I'm not going to use yet because I don't know how large it needs to be yet. So I could move, have moved the allocation into the handle read size. Um, I, for whatever reason, chose not to. But in the first step of the read operation, we're not going to use that buffer at all because we don't know how much data to read. The question was, um, where did we use the, the buffer, the in, in buffer underscore? And the answer was, we haven't used it yet, and we could probably have moved the allocation to this point. So at this point, we now know how large our buffer needs to be to read in our message. So we resize the buffer to be the correct size, and then we start another asynchronous read operation, this time reading into the actual buffer. And then it's going to call our final handler, han handle read data. All right, so here, handle read data. First thing we're doing is we're going to acquire ownership of the buffer. So we're going to swap in a null pointer there, 
And the reason I'm doing this is not because there's anybody else in this example who could actually take this, but imagine a situation where we had multiple different threads, IO threads, who might be polling at the same time. So you didn't want to throw a lock in there, but the, the reason I put this code in is to signify that the, this handler needs to take ownership of the buffer at this point, and, and that, that the, there will be a new buffer that's going to be allocated. So now we're going to do this, and now the question is, what's this parcel queue thing? Well, and that's starting the next read, so it just goes back into that loop. So now we've got, this is what our control flow looks like, and we don't know what this parcel queue thing is yet. So now we're going to have to look at the runtime class. So these are the data members in the runtime class. We've got our IO service. We have our acceptor. We've got our execution thread. Those are all related to the runtime service's responsibility of managing the IO thread and the execution thread. Then we've got this map of connections. And that map's got mapping from a TCP endpoint to a shared pointer referring to a connection. And finally, we've got these two queues. One queue is taking an STD vector of car star. Now, why can't I just stick an STD vector into that queue? Why do I have to have it be a pointer? So the reason is that it's a lock-free queue. I can only put plain old data um, types into a lock-free queue. So I'm, I'm using the inefficiency of an added allocation here to allow me to write this whole example without doing any locks. So then we have another queue, which we're going to call local queue. And this is for actions that we want to execute locally, actions that the IO thread wants to locally execute, and which it's going to tell the, the execution thread about. Finally, we have this stop fla flag, which the IO thread will use to notify the execution thread when it's time to shut down. All right, so here are some of the other members. The three in the top are not so much important. Um, we've got one that's going to start launch the execution thread, start accepting connections. It's pretty standard. The stop is pretty standard. The real important ones are the execution loop, the serialization code for the parcel, and the deserialization code for the parcel. So let's look at the execution loop first. All right, so this is the execution loop's control flow. The dashed lines represent sort of optional paths, that it can go on, e on either one of those paths every time it does a loop around. So if, if it's going to pull from the parcel queue, which it does first, it'll go and it'll deserialize the message, and then it'll execute it. And if it's pulling from this local queue, then it's just going to execute it, because there's no serialization work to be done. All right, so this is what the execution loop looks like. So it's in a while loop that's checking that stop flag. So one important thing to note is if there's no work to do whatsoever, if, if it's just spinning, then the operations that we're doing here is we're reading an atomic variable, we're trying to get something from a lock-free queue, we're trying to get something from another lock-free queue. So this will just spin and eat up CPU time. There's no waiting whatsoever here. This will be using 100% of your CPU time 100% of the time. So. so first of all, we check the, maybe I meant to switch the order of these two. So first we check the uh, local queue to see if there's any actions that the IO thread wants us to do. And if there are, we just go ahead and execute it. We don't have to do anything like deserialization. And otherwise, we check this parcel queue, which has messages from other machines. And if we've got a message there, then we go ahead and deserialize it, and then we execute it. All right, so this is what the deserialization code looks like. And it's, again, doesn't look that much different from the most basic serialization examples. The only thing that's not been explained is this container device thing, um, which is a IO streams seekable device. And the code for that's in the GitHub repository, but I'm not going to go through it because it's a bit long. But basically what that does is this creates a stream that's going to um, that's going to write to this vector. And we need to do that because serialization is all stream based. There's no way to say, hey, just write into this vector. So this is, again, we're doing derived class deserialization from the base class pointer. The action class is obviously um, abstract, so we couldn't just create an instance of it. And then we're going to return it. And one thing to note is that this is returning a raw pointer because it's going to be, um, it's, it, 
Yeah, actually, it might not make sense for it to do that. It was returning a raw pointer because I used to stick it into a, into a lock-free queue where it would be executed later. That could probably be a shared pointer now. All right, so now this is what our control flow looks like when you marry the two pieces together. So we've got this read loop that's happening in the I.O. thread, and then we have this execution loop that's happening on the execution thread. And then, of course, we have the possibility that while we're executing something, we might go ahead and write something. So let's take a look at that write code. So this is, again, back to the connection class. And we've got three functions here, but one of them is really an implementation detail. Do you remember before, before I said we're not going to do the, deserial, the serialization of the, the action class in the I.O. thread? So what we want to do is when we get an async write, we want to just immediately schedule a new action that's going to serialize um, our function, our, our, our action class, and then send it over the wire. All right, so this is the actual, the actual implementation. And so the first thing we have to do is we have to create some, some outbound buffers. And these are, again, objects which are going to need to live for longer than, than the lifetime of just our local scope. They're going to need to live until the asynchronous operation is complete. So first, we're creating some, some, uh, a vector of char. And then we're going to serialize the action into the, that vector. Then we're going to create a pointer for a, the size of the, the, the vector. Now, that might seem a little bit silly. Um, you could, I suppose, um, just read from the size variable in the vector class. But if you really want to be standard compliant, you don't really know where that size variable is going to be. All right, so then we're going we're gonna to create a vector of buffers. So this is something a little bit new. So this is using the scatter gather capability of ACO. So it's saying we've got two contiguous regions of memory that we want to write. And so then we're going to pass it to asynchronous write. And we're going to have this handler. And the handler that we have is basically just going to check if there is an error or not. Because really the only reason that we have that handler and the only reason we're passing those shared pointers is so that we'll know that the shared pointers stay alive until after this handler is, has been executed. So that's the serialization code, very much analogous to the deserialization code. So this is the connect code for establishing a new connection. So this is similar to the most simple examples, but I've added um, one thing here that's kind of important to go over, which is um, looping, in a connection, looping over connections to make sure that you can connect to a server, even if you're starting up the server and the client at around the same time. So normally, if you connect with ACO and it can't find the server, it just immediately um, gives up. So first thing we're going to do after we resolve the host is we're going to see if we already have a connection to the particular machine that we're trying to connect to because we've got that nice map um, of connections. And then we're going to enter this loop and we're going to try to connect to a socket and if we fail we're going to sleep for 100 milliseconds and we're going to try that 64 times. And so this allows the example code to actually run because Otherwise, if you started the client before the server, the client would just quit. This way, if, you, if you're starting them in two shells, you, you can start the client, and you have a little bit of time to start the server, too. And then after we've started, after we've established a new connection, we've got to start reading on it. So for every one of the connections, we have to enter that read loop. All right, so now let's use this little runtime. OK, so we're going to do like a hello world example. Um, it's going to be pretty boring. We're just going to send a message to all the connected nodes, which will print out hello world and then stop the runtime system. So you'd run it like this. Um, I didn't show any of the programs options code, but it's all there in the GitHub repository. So basically, we have one that's acting as the server, which is not going to connect to anybody else. And then you can have an arbitrary number of other processes that will connect to that server. So we need some mechanism to execute some code once we've gotten everybody connected. Because we're doing everything asynchronously here and we, we haven't had any way for the user to plug into our connects or to our receives, 
there, we have to have some way to, for the user to say, hey, do this once you know, five clients have connected. So that's encapsulated into the logic of the runtime's constructor. So we're going to give it some std function, which will be our main function. And it's going to execute that after a certain number of clients have connected to it. So that's what the, the C tour looks like. And the wait for is the number of clients to wait for before it invokes that function. So, the, so this is what our action looks like, the action that we're going to send to every one of our clients. So again, we've just got hello world, and then stop this node. And then our boilerplate serialization code and our clone call, which is going to create a um, base class pointer from the, of, of, of the derived class. And we've got our export code there. So this is what the main function looks like. So first thing we're doing is we're going to get the map, map of connections. Then we're going to create a count, a, a shared pointer that represents how many connections we have. Next, we're going to go into this for loop. And for every connection that we have, we're going to start an asynchronous write. And we're going to give it a callback. And that callback is going to decrement that count. And when it reaches 0, it's going to shut down everything. And so the question is, what would happen if the, this hello world main waited for all the asynchronous writes to finish and then was to call stop itself? So let's say we were to use a condition variable and a mutex in, in, so that that lambda would, instead of just calling rt.stop, it would notify the um, hello world main to wake up from a condition variable. Anyone want to hazard a guess as to what would happen? All right, so it would deadlock. And the reason it's going to deadlock is because, it's not where I wanted to go with that yet. It's going to deadlock because we've got the main, I, the main execution thread that is asleep at the OS level. And then we have the I.O. thread that's trying to serialize me messages to send over the wire. But it can't get them serialized because there's nobody to serialize them for it. So this is a common problem that you see in systems that do user level threading or that do, um, they, well, it's also known as green threading, or, or any sort of system like this, where you basically, all of your operations that involve I.O. that might block to the operating system have to be done asynchronously. Because anything that would block at the OS level your execution thread is going to completely screw up your processing. So next, let's talk about how we could extend this example to build remote futures. So is everybody here familiar with STD future? Is there anybody here who's not familiar or who's kind of somewhat familiar? OK. So an STD future is a construct that's going to represent a computation that will, be ex that will happen in the future. It will represent the value that that computation is going to produce. So like an STD future int would represent a int that's going to be computed at some point in the future. So regular you know, C++11 standard threading library will have this capability for things within your own process, for doing asynchronous computations within your own process, and then later pulling that future to um, get, get its result. So one of the things we want to do is we want to be able to do this across the network. We want to be able to say, hey, go do this computation over there. And then when you're done with it, send its result back here. Because otherwise, we can basically just do boring stuff like hello world. So the way that such a construct would work is that we'd need to have two of these parcels, two messages that we're going to send. The first one's going to start the remote action. And then the second one is going to send the result back to the caller. So here's a little diagram. So we've got on node 1, we've got some future object that we're creating. And then we're going to send a message over to node 2. Then we're going to somehow wait or suspend. And then, then eventually, once that um, producer thread on node 2 creates the value, it's going to send the result back to node 1. So there's a couple more things that we need to actually do this. Um, and this is where this very simple example kind of turns into the sort of large runtime system that um, I work on at LSU. So first thing we need is we need some sort of user level threading. Because we have to have some sort of way to suspend execution of one of our actions 
that needs to wait on something. We can't just do it all asynchronously. Sometimes we really do want to wait on something. But we can't, we can't block at the OS level. We can't call something like an STD mutex from inside one of our actions. That would block out the execution thread and until that mutex was unlocked. So you'd use something like boost context or boost coroutines for this. And what you'd do is instead of executing um, each, each, instead of executing actions, you'd be executing boost context, um, the context objects. And that, that would be doing the, the threading completely at the user level. And what that gives you is the capability for that thread to suspend its execution and return to your control loop so that another thread can be executed. All right, and so the second thing is we need some sort of way to find our future object when we send that, back, that message back with the result. So this is a kind of complicated problem because we have to manage the lifetime of that object. So we, we could just pass along the local memory address, but again, we still need a way to manage the lifetime of the object of the future's shared state. And if we pass along the local um, memory address, we'd also have to pass along some identifying information like the um, IP address and the port that it's going to send the result back to. So if we give the future state a globally unique identifier, some sort of address that's going to span all the nodes in our computation, then it simplifies things and it abstracts away some of the node-centric computation. So it's just like we have some, you know, a second layer of virtual memory. We've got some address that we've got associated with this future state. We give the address to our action that's going to go to be remotely computed. And then when it's done, it sends a message back saying, hey, just go ahead and, and set the value of this object at this global address. OK, so how do we ensure that the future state stays alive? Well, we have to have some sort of garbage collection. So basically, we want to have some sort of remote or distributed smart pointer. OK, so we have other needs for user level threading in, in our framework. It's specifically, it's really useful for certain types of computation. What we like to do is we like to take our algorithms and split them up into very fine-grained serial units of execution. So by very fine-grained, I mean stuff that's going to execute in around 100 um, microseconds. So with your regular p-threads, the overhead of a p-thread is a lot larger than 100 microseconds. So you don't want to use your OS level threading. So we want to have thousands of, of active threads per core in our system, basically, or the capability to have that with lifetimes of about 100 microseconds. And so you're able to do this with user-level threading, with having your context switches, your, your allocation, all of this happen, happening in user space instead of through kernel calls. So um, the question was, uh, that POSIX threads has. So can you, can you maybe elaborate on what you mean by that? I'm, I'm, I'm not familiar with, with, with that. Um, but, but I mean, the, 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 the capability, but I mean, I'd, I'd like to try and understand. Um, OK, we can talk about it offline. But Yeah, we're not talking about that. That's not what we're talking about. What I'm talking about is that we have, a bun we have some assembly code that runs in 50, 100 nanoseconds that swaps a contact. That's, that does a, you know, saves all the registers, saves the stack pointer, and then loads a new set of registers in a new stack pointer. So it's, it's not anything that's calling into POSIX. It's just a piece of assembly code that's switching out our stack for a new stack. And, and it, that's, that's all that I mean by user level threading, is that we're, cre we're ma allocating the stacks ourselves and we're using some assembly to set them up ourselves. And that gives us the capability to do very, very fast context switching because none of it's happening at the OS level. No, that, that's not what we're using to, to implement our user level threading. What we're using is a bit of, a, is a bit of assembly code, basically. Which it, Right, so that would be the fallback of the fallback. 
So what we use is we first go to assembly in our, in our code. And if that's not available, we go to boost context. And if boost context can't find a de decent implementation, it's going to fall back to doing the make context. Um, but in the, that implementation is never one that you should fall back to in the code because that will be slow. And it is deprecated. Um, we, we, norm, we use basically a, a um, version of boost coroutines for Linux and Windows. Um, I don't know that we have hand-rolled assembly that's going to work on, on Mac um, or that we have the build system support because the, the assembly for uh, Linux should probably work fine. <laughs> All right, so we have other, there's other useful things that you can do with a global address space. So specifically, it's not just f like future objects that you might want a global address space for. This sort of um, system is really boring if you can only execute free functions. You want to have some sort of objects that are going to be globally addressable. And so again, you could just pass around pointers and then identify information about what machine they're on, but you run into problems when you want to start moving objects around. One of the nice things about having a global addressing system is that if you've got some unique identifier which is going to be used to look up some, some you know, to look up the what node is this on, what virtual memory addresses it on, on that node, then you can update the table without updating all of the references so that you can ensure that your references don't get invalidated when you move an object from one machine to another machine. All right, that's basically all I said there. Okay, so we call those objects in HPX components. And they're, they're the, they are to classes what actions are to functions. That is, they're, they're the remotable equivalent. So we say that a function is remotable if we can invoke it on another machine. And we say that a method's in, in remotable if we can invoke it on an object in another machine. And we say that, an ob that a component is remotable if it's got some remotable method. All right, so this is some HPX indoctrination, um, which I am obligated to sneak into my slides. So has so anybody here used MPI? One, two, okay, a couple people. All right, so let me start off by saying that MPI is really good for a large number of tasks, um, specifically anything that fits into the nice square hole. But there's a certain subset of parallel applications that do not fit well into the MPI paradigm, specifically applications that have either a lot of communication where you're not going to be able to really reduce your bandwidth that much. You're not going to benefit from reducing it. You really have to hide your latencies or, and, and or applications where you have really, really, really dynamic dependencies so that there's no easy way to divide up your, your, your workload. With MPI, MPI wants to try to reduce your latencies as much as possible, and it wants to try to split up your workload statically. What we try to do with HPX is, is very different. So I'm going to come back to that slide a little bit later, actually. So um, this is the sort of tongue-in-cheek mantra which I like to use to describe HPX, which is recursion is parallelism. So who here has written um, code in Lisp or Haskell? Who here has written fast code in Lisp, Lisp or Haskell? Right, so most people in the HPC world would never write um, a functional style code because most of our machines are designed to run procedural style code. C, Fortran, those are gonna generally be faster in the you know, serial context. What we mean by recursion is parallelism is, is that, tr so traditionally we, use the, we don't use these functional programming techniques, but our programming model is built around them. So we're built around the idea that if you take an algorithm and you divide it up into sub-algorithms, the smallest size that you can, and then you have clearly defined dependencies between them so that each one, each one of your sub-algorithms is a function, having clearly defined dependencies being the inputs, the parameters, and then a clearly defined output, your return value. So then you've got a very simple de dependency graph, which is really easy to parallelize. And so that's the basis of our entire computing model, that we take algorithms that don't fit well into MPI, we reformulate them in, in a way that we can have control over the grain size, control over the size of these sub-algorithms to tune for certain machines and to, for, to tune for certain latency amounts. And then we just execute them in this very asynchronous, um, unstructured parallelism manner. So also writing functional style code is easy, I'm gonna assert. 
it's easier to, to write things with async um, that are going to run in parallel than to try to go and parallelize a loop yourself if you're not using something like OpenMP. All right, so is anybody here familiar with um, partial differential equations? All right, anybody here familiar with the wave equation? Anyone here know more about me than the wave equation? Pro probably. All right, you're, are you a physicist, sir? You, you're a physicist? All right, I am not a physicist to point out anything that I have wrong here, but I'm pretty comfortable with the wave equation. So the wave equation is a second order linear hyperbolic PDE. So <laughs> I got a couple more like that. So I'm going to tell you guys right now that basically everything that we do in HBC boils down to solving some sort of PDE or doing some sort of linear algebra. But basically the only, you know, linear algebra, we know how to do that. It's pretty, it's embarrassingly parallel. It's pretty simple to do um, in parallel. So basically the only thing that anybody's interested in really researching these days is how do we solve PDEs. All science that we do on computers breaks down to how do we solve PDEs. That's an over uh, simplification, but um, <laughs> they're, they're, let me rather say a large number of the problems that we solve with computational science involve solving partial differential equations. So this So the, my, my friend here is mentioning um, gravitational waves with, with t tensor equations, which, which gets to be very, very complicated math that I think like maybe five people in the world really know how to do. Um, all right, so this is, a, a, the, this is the hello world of PDEs. And it's the hello world of PDEs because there's a very simple um, direct solution to it, which is very rare for PDEs. So... We're going to solve this using uh, central finite differencing, differencing, which is a simple explicit me method. So we're going to use periodic boundary conditions, which means that when we're at the edge of our discretized space, we're going to wrap it around. Now, this doesn't really, there's very few problems that this actually is applicable to, but it's, it's kind of a cool thing to do. You'll usually get some sort of interference if you don't pick the number of discrete points that you have very, very carefully. So this is what our discretation looks like. So Discretation of a PDE basically means we're taking the equation and we're not directly solving it, but we're going we're gonna to come up with a solution where the continuous domain is represented by some finite number of discrete points. This is the basis of how we solve pretty much any PDE on a computer. So this thing on the right here at the top is what's called the current condition. This basically is the thing that we have to satisfy to ensure that the algorithm is numerically stable. Numerically stable being a big word that scientists like to use to say the code doesn't work. So if we don't satisfy that condition, the code doesn't work. So we can pretty easily see what the dependencies are here, even if you don't know anything about linear, about partial differential equations. We've got this u, which is defined in terms of four other values of u. So we've got one time a step ago at x plus dx. So one time a step ago at um, you know, a point that's right next to us. We've got an, another dependency on a value that's in the other direction. And we've got a dependency on the value at our, the, our, at our position one time a step ago and two time steps ago. So this is what the HPX code would look like for, for solving this. And I, I use this as the simple example of what futurized code looks like because it's a lot, it makes a lot more sense than the normal simple example, which is Fibonacci. So what we've got here is where we've got our four different dependencies. I've color coded them because I've given them ridiculous names here. Um, and so we're going to start each one with HPX async, which is the same thing as STD async, except it works in the remote context. And you'll notice that it takes this argument of HPX colon colon find here. That's going to return a global address. In this case, it's the global address of the current machine that we're on. So we've got these four futures. And then when we need these four futures, we're going to call get on all of them. And so this is a very nice, simple, asynchronous way and recursive way of solving this problem. Now, it's, it's, it's not actually recursive in this case because we're storing all the results into some, or into some global array here, the U array. But you could write it completely recursively. So the point of this um, mantra of recursion is parallelism is the idea that normally people think of recursion as being slow and bad, 
when you're do using every call to a function being paralyzed through an async call, well, then recursion can actually be fast because every recursive call is going to be done in parallel. This represents one time step? This represents one time step. That's correct. Yes, that would block, but I've got very tight dependence. So he was asking, why, why am I calling get here? This would block. I've got very tight dependencies here. Um, for the next iteration, I'm going to need those values. So I'm only going to be able to parallelize so much here before I need to block. In the ideal world, what I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want to find a way to, to do multiple time steps at the same time. When yeah, um, so, so there, there are other constructs here, but I didn't want to get too much into unexplained HPX constructs. There are simpler, yeah, go ahead. Uh, the first get block, yeah, that's right. So the when he's asking if the, when the first get here for the ut minus 1 and x plus dx, when we call that get, will that block? And then only after that's returned will the next one um, be called. Yes, that's correct. Um, So the, the, the remark was that typically you want to overlap all the gets and receives. Yes, you do, but um, no part of this code is, uh, no part of that bottom line is going to proceed without all four of them. So it's perfectly fine to do it that way. Um, the, the, the point that these two, two gentlemen are making is that I'm not doing a particularly good job of composing the weighting on these futures. And there are constructs that I could do this with. I wanted to keep this as simple as I could. So yes, I, I sh for each point, um, for each one of my discrete values, this is, this is an element-wise operation. So I'm going to do this for each discrete value. I'm going to have four different parallel operations happening. Okay, and so at each point, can be a separate independent Right, oh, right. What, what will happen is, is that in, in HPX, we have a certain number of operating system level threads that very much like our execution thread from earlier, which are running something like our execution loop where they're pulling tasks off of a queue, which they're going to execute. And the only difference is that the tasks that we're pulling off of the queue, we're invoking them in such a way that they can yield. They can say, hey, I'm not done executing. I'm just suspending for now. So you know, go do something else and come back to me. But so it's, it's, it's just a more complicated version of the um, example we went over earlier. By more complicated, I mean this example is 500 lines of code. HPX is like 100,000. Um, there's a little bit of complexity. Yes. That I was hoping somebody was going to mention that. He he. Um, the question was, um, how many features will this create? Won't this create an exponential number of them? This code is going to do a lot of redundant computations because we're doing this element-wise. There's going to be a lot of overlapping dependencies between neighboring points. So the the better way to do this is to have an array of futures, which represents all of the different future values for the next time step. And then to have everybody go and look in that array instead of spawning the futures themselves. So the answer is yes. This will spawn an exponential number of futures. Um, this is the naive version of how to solve this. Um, why would, so the question was what I only want the, the, the values for the boundaries. So this, this code, I'm not using a stencil. This is not a stencil code. I'm just every discrete point I'm computing. So, so the, the question was regarding um, normally when you solve a problem like this, you'd split it up into chunks, and you'd only communicate at the boundary regions of those chunks. Um, in that you might take, like if you had 12 discrete points, you might take 4, 4, and 4, and then internally you have enough information in each one of those chunks to compute um, the inside values, and you only have to communicate the values that overlap with the next region. In this code, we're not doing that. We just want to keep it nice and simple. In the rest of our um, codes, we are using stencils of some shape or form. All right, any other questions about the PDE? All right, so and let me go back real quick to this slide that I wanted to get to. So this is all, these are all the versions of the serializable um, structures that we have in HPX. And now that you've kind of seen a little bit of what our um, 
this sort of functional style that we use, you'll kind of understand why we want to be able to serialize some of these. So HPX tuple and, and, and HPX fusion, um, we don't actually have a namespace called HPX fusion, but it's just meant to represent that we can serialize fusion sequences. Um, we use these for a lot of different functional programming things, and most notably, we use these to serialize the arguments to a function. So in our simple example, we created this action-based class, which just took one parameter, and we had no control over that. In HPX, we've got actions that can take any arbitrary set of parameters and return any arbitrary value. And we use fusion tuples to represent those arguments. Then we've got a version of uh, a boost any, which is serializable. And this is, again, through the magic of boost serialization support for serializing derived classes through the base class pointer. So then we have HPX function, which is a version of STD function that is serializable. Um, and this is uh, substantially more convoluted because it, it's a little bit hard to serialize a V table, um, which is basically what we're doing. And so again, this, this, one of the reasons why we need to have the serialization of the derived class to the base class is we couldn't really do this without that. And then we've got, we can serialize our exceptions, um, which is quite nice because if we have an error that happens on a remote node, we take a stack trace, we record what machine it's on, then we send it back to the, what we call the console locality, and then we get that error message there. So if any operation throws an exception anywhere that's unhandled, it will bubble back up on the machine that the client's actually looking at. So then we've got HPX bind. So that's a version of boost bind with placeholders and all that you can serialize. And then we've got the next step, which we haven't written yet, but that's to make, H to make boost um, Phoenix serializable. Because we can't serialize C++11 lambdas. We don't, they don't have a type that we can access. But we can serialize fusion sequences, which means we can serialize boost proto, which means we can serialize um, HPX or boost Phoenix. So um, the, 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 one of my colleagues, Thomas Heller, is the guy who wrote Phoenix version 3. So that's something we'll probably see in the next year or so is a serializable version of Phoenix. So, all right, so the ability to use functional programming techniques is important to us. It might not be important to all um, you know, network communication, but the way that we've done things the way th the, this way is so that we can serialize all of these constructs. Um, and these will, these will be incredibly important when we have the um, algorithm, the parallel algorithms version of um, the STL. So things like for each or things like find or copy that work not only in parallel, but work in parallel on distributed data structures. So imagine that you've got some giant um, STD map that's distributed across, you know, a thousand nodes. Um, and you want to run for each on it in parallel. Well, that's, that's kind of a hard thing to do. And it's very nice if you can just plug in some sort of lambda expression or, you know, some sort of Phoenix expression to the, that for each, which can then be sent around to all the different machines. It allows us to take code that we've been using in a serial context and very easily convert it to work in a parallel context. Caveat, it's not actually easy, but I'm going to wave my hands and claim that it is. All right, so this next section of my talk um, is basically my run over content. So I've got like five or ten different um, lesser known tips and tricks related to boost ACO, boost serialization, and just general object transmission stuff. So if anybody really, really, really wants to see one of these more than the others, tell me and I'll start with that one. Zero copy. Okay, zero copy. Well, that happens to be at the front of the list. So zero copy is a really fun problem that we run into when we combine ACO with serialization. I'm sorry if I'm in your guys' way here. So who here knows what zero copy means? Okay. All right, so zero copy basically refers to the use in the kernel of, of scatter gather operations and the ability to, to with regular you know, socket programming, to just pass in a pointer and to have the kernel just directly read that pointer and then directly write to the socket from that pointer without any copies. This is incredibly important to network programming. In specific, with frameworks like MPI for parallel programming, almost all of the um, writes and reads are going to be zero copy. Now, when you're using serialization, as we saw earlier, we had that container device, um, IO streams, and we were allocating these buffers. And so we actually end up having, or at one point we had two or three more copies than we needed um, to get the object from, from reading from the socket, 
bringing it into some sort of vector of cars, and then copying it to the actual object. So, zeros. So, I've got an algorithm for doing this, which is mostly implemented. Um, I know that it works, but there's one problem with it, so we haven't put it into HPX yet. And it turns out to be a little bit more complicated than you'd imagine. So first of all, we need a special zero copy archive. And this archive, instead of using streams to write its output, it's going to store the archive as an STD vector of ACO buffers. And it's also going to store um, some management data for the things that it has to actually allocate. So we've got, we're, it's a two-pass algorithm. So for the writes, first we iterate over all of the buffers. For, so we go through, we, we, we do the serialization, we, figure, we create all the buffers, then we have to iterate over all the buffers, and we have to figure out the size of each buffer. Then we have to create a vector that has the sizes of all, each, of all the buffers, and we're going to stick that, in, in the, and we have to stick that in as the first thing that we're going to send in the message. And we have to send the size of that vector first, because we need to know how large each one of our messages is to know how much data to read from the socket. And then the past two, we go over and we actually send the data. On the read side, we've got a similar algorithm. So we, we read in first the size of this array of sizes. Then we read in the array of sizes. And then once we have that information, we can go through and we can set up all of the necessary data structures that might need to be set up if a vector has to be resized, et cetera. And then we can directly copy into them using buffers on the other side. All right. So. Any other of these topics that people really want to see? T yeah. It, 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 I did order these in, in list of coolness. So anybody here um, ever do anything with network programming where you really need low latencies? All right. <laughs> so there's this really evil thing about TCP, which is that it's not really designed for low latency at all. And by really evil, I mean it doesn't really do what I particularly need, so I think it's evil. So first thing I'm going to talk about is this TCP no delay. So there's this thing called the Nagel algorithm, which is designed to reduce TCP congestion. Now, that's really important if you've got like your laptops and whatnot, but if I'm on a supercomputer, I really don't care how much congestion I have. It's my network. I'm supposed to use that up as much as I can. So the Nagel algorithm reduces TCP IP congestion by buffering small messages if there are unact writes, so unacknowledged writes. So the algorithm looks like this. So whenever we're going to go to send new data, we add the new data to the buffered data. If the buffered data is larger than some limit called the maximum segment size, then we send the data. Or if there's no unact writes, we send the data. Now this all sounds fine in practice, but it turns out that it interoperates really, really unpleasantly with this other feature called delayed TCP acts. So there's this RFC that says that a TCP implementation is allowed to delay up to 500 microseconds before sending, 500 milliseconds before sending X. So I'm just going to go to the example of where it's bad. Wait, no, there's the example. All right, so here's when it gets bad. So A, some machine sends, sends data to B. So then B receives the data from, da the data from A, but, and it buffers the ACK. Then A tries to send a small message to B, small enough that it's not going to be above that limit. And then the message gets buffered because A hasn't received an act yet. And then B can wait for up to 500 milliseconds, half a second, before it responds. So you've got an added half a second of latency. So if you're doing anything where you care more about latency than bandwidth, or even if you don't, in a lot of cases when you're sending just a lot of small messages, and or if you've got a real-time system where delivery is really more important than your bandwidth, you want to use TCP no delay and use TCP quick act. Now, TCP no delay, there's an ACO option for it. Um, for TCP quick act, you have to use this ACO detail socket option to do it. Um, and I'm hoping to eventually get a patch in there so that we can get a TCP quick act option that looks a lot like the no delay option. But so this can be really important for, for increasing your TCP congestion and reducing your latency. All right, so I'm just going to go through the rest of these in order until I run out of time, which is going to be soonish. All right, so ACO IO service pools. So this is, there's an example of this in the ACO examples. So basically what this is is it's a data structure that represents some number of 
IO service objects and some number of SCD threads that are running the event, uh, the completion event processing loop. Um, and it's one of the few, normally ACO separates um, the idea of threads from IO service. So this is a nice abstraction if you really just want to have a bunch of IO threads and a bunch of IO, IO services. So we've got one STD thread for each IO service object. Each thread's calling the IO service run. And so one important little trick to take out of this um, code is if you ever want to make an IO service that's going to keep running forever until you tell it to stop, normally it just runs until there's no more work items to process. What you can do is you can do something like this where you create this artificial work item and then that IO service call will not return until somebody calls the dot stop method on that IO service object. So that's what all of these objects are going to do in, in this little utility. And so we, this uses a round robin scheme for distributing work across the IO service objects. And what I mean by that is that we've got some get IO service call which the users of this class would use. And each time it's going to return, the first time it's going to return IO service object zero, the next time IO service object one. And so this gives you a fair distribution of IO service objects among your work. The benefit to this is that if you're doing some amount of actual real computation in your completion handlers, then it might take a little time for them to do this. And by parallelizing the processing of your completion handlers, you can get some speed up in your application. All right, bitwise serialization. So this is into the serialization tips. So serialization has this capability to just say, hey, this data structure, I'm going to treat it like a POD and just like, serialize it in a completely dangerous way if it was not a POD. So this is um, a really important thing because it's kind of hidden in the docs and not a lot of people know about it. So um, you should generally only use this for POD types um, and because it, it literally will just take the size of the data structure and then just write out that number of bytes. So here's some code which, will, which tells serialization that if a tuple contains only um, bitwise serializable types, then the tuple is bitwise serializable. So we use a little bit of MPL magic here. And I think this is a particularly nifty trick um, because it, it, it just, it's very nice. Normally the STD tuple would be serialized element-wise and it's going to have a greater complexity that way. Um, last, last one. Last slide, I promise. Um, the question was about network byte order. Um, so, oh, well, well, so my last slide's on Indianness, not so much network byte order. Um, the answer would then be I don't know. Um, I th it, it's going to be in whatever order it's written out, really. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, so, so in, these, in this example here, where I was sending the size field, if in our actual code we use bo the boost Indian library and we'll use boost colon colon u little 64t. If you want it to be by Indian, you got to use something like the boost Indian library to ensure that you've got a consistent Indianness of the data types you're trying to write. Um, MPL fold, yada yada. So array optimizations, this is one of the real big gotchas because I don't even think this one is documented. So if you're writing a new serialization archive, if you want it to use the really fast array optimizations as, instead of doing the ON element-wise serialization, you've got to specify this macro when you're registering your archive. This is a really great way to treat yourself in the foot. If you don't specify this macro, it will do an ON serialization over all the elements of your vectors, your arrays, of any container whatsoever. All of the built-in serialization um, archives have this specified, fortunately. So this next one, um, exporting templates. I'm going to kind of skip over that unless anybody has a real particular interest in the sporting, exporting template-derived classes for serialization. That's kind of what I thought. All right, so portable archives. So um, there's a portable archive example in the serialization library. I will say this, you can't use it because it's not actually portable. The problem is that it's, por it's perfectly portable, but the basic binary I primitive that ships with boost serialization is not. And that's what they use for loading and saving binary. So you have to use your own version of that as well. So we've got a version of that that's actually legitimately portable in terms of it works across Indiannesses. And we've also got some other cool features we've added to it, like we have a compression filter built in. Um, and we can use a container with these instead of streams for input and output. And you can also tell these to not write the serialization header. That little serialization header 
of the um, serialization colon colon archive, that'll show up even in your binary archives. If you're writing very small archives, that can really hurt you in terms of performance. All right, I think that's pretty much all. Questions, comments? Anyone? Yeah? Sorry, let, let, uh, um, no, the question was do we have two threads, one in HPX, one dedicated to IO and one dedicated to execution. That example used two threads, but that example is something that you could easily extend to what HPX does, which is in execution threads and in IO threads. Normally what we do is we bind to, say if we have a 48 core machine, we'll bind to maybe 46 or 47 or, for, or 48 cores as execution threads. Then we'll have, nor, the default is we'll have four threads that are in an IO service pool that are servicing the um, sockets. Then we'll have another couple IO threads in other IO service pools that are doing various other IO related tasks like deadline timers or file IO. Because remember, we want to try to get as much IO out of our execution threads as possible. One of the important things in designing a system like this is to have the execution and the I.O. completely separate from each other, happening in two separate sets of threads. But the answer is no, we have, we have some arbitrary number of threads that we're using in HPX. But those threads are dedicated to tasks. Those threads are dedicated to executing tasks. They will execute whatever task is next on the queue. And we... You have threads that are dedicated Yes. Right. Um, right now, we do serialization and deserialization in the threads that execute user code, because that's not an I/O operation. Yeah. Right. Right. Right, so I mean, normally if you're sending out, a t so I'll tell you this, whenever we allocate um, objects in, in HPX, the default, the default pool size is 65K. We never send one task out. We're sending many, many, many tasks. So when you send an ap action over to another machine, that action might spawn local um, futures, and it might spawn lo 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 other local threads at the HPX threading level. And so, yes, we're going to take advantage of, of that parallelism. One of the important things to note here is we, we've got a, a really high level of granularity. We have applications that use billions of HPX threads, of these user-level tasks, um, and, and, and are, are running on relatively small machines. Yeah? This might be a really basic question. So if you have a thread dedicated to I.O. tasks, mm -hmm. why do you need to have different reads? Well, so we've got a, we're, what the ACE, the async reads are direct. The question was, if you've got a thread dedicated to I/O tasks, why do you have to have async reads? So keep in mind, we've got the execution happening in the execution threads. They're the ones who are going to want to do the reads or the writes, but the 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 I/O threads just processing them. Okay. All right. Any other questions? All right. I hope this was somewhat useful to people. The examples are again on that GitHub repository, and they should all compile with like GCC and. Boost five point boost one point five three. Um, I'll try to see if I can get him to uh, throw a Microsoft Visual Studio file in there, and I'll try to make sure they work on Mac. Um, yeah. So um, it's funny that you mentioned this. I randomly happen to have a Solaris machine that's running in my server room, so I can probably you know. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I know it's not dead. I. So it's a, it's, a, it's a funny story, which I probably shouldn't tell with the mic on, but I, I had a, um, I, I'm, I'm in charge of the, I'm working with the AV guys, so I'll just cut this out later. But I had a friend who's in industry who called me up one day and he's like, hey, do you want a Solaris server? And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and the next week a server just shows up at our lab and I just plugged it in and it's just been running there. <laughs> so we, Solaris is kind of on our target list, but um, we're, we're focusing more on things like making it build on Mac and um, stuff like that. Yeah. All right. So. And I, I, I just want to also say that this very small percentages of this were actually like work that I exclusively d did. Uh, most of this is stuff that my boss, who's a lot smarter than me, and my colleagues, who are also a lot smarter than me, 
did. Um, and one of them is right there, Vigne. Um, so just this is not just me, it's collaborative effort. And also the ACO and serialization authors who are pretty awesome people um, and also a lot smarter than me. So thanks.